At the heart of the Jesus movement was a very simple act, and it was an act of eating together. And in a sense, what we do on a Sunday morning is reenact that. And it was a radical act because Jesus ate with both women and men. He ate with both Jews and Gentiles, and he ate with people who were both rich and poor. And that was quite socially revolutionary. And in a sense, the church at its best tries to keep on doing those things, breaking down the barriers between classes, genders, and races, and breaking down the systems that maintain barriers, systems of wealth and power and privilege. And of course, like any institution, we fail quite regularly, um, and we uh, become self-serving, and we sort of um, try to appease the powerful and the privileged in order to keep our own power and privilege. But at our best and at the best of our gospel is this call back to a radical equality between people. So it, it's with uh, great pleasure that I've invited Helen along this morning because my understanding of the trade union movement, it also has at its heart that egalitarian vision. Um, yes, well, it does. And thank you. Kia ora. It's very nice to be here this morning. Um, yeah, and we, like you, have our weaknesses and our strengths, but fundamentally we work off a f f set of core values, which is that all people are equal and that the power imbalances in society need a counter push and that we pride ourselves being part of that push back. Um, not very successfully at the moment, really, because there's a feeling that, you know, the, the forces against distribution and, and a decent life for everybody are pretty strong out there. But we are the largest democratic organisation in New Zealand and uh, one of our key roles is to speak for working people and to try and improve how their lives are lived. And, and when you say you're one of the largest, well, I mean, how many members are, are linked okay, with there? there are 360,000 workers uh, belong to trade unions and that's 22% of the workforce. They are very unevenly um, split. Only 9% of the private sector are able to be unionised. And it is our view that for many, many workers, particularly those in, new econo in the new economy, actually, firstly, the union movement is inaccessible to them. That's our problem. We operate in traditional industries, trains, planes, ships, mining, manufacturing and the rest. But also the industrial situation and the way the law is constructed makes union membership a big risk if you're not in a unionised workplace and you decide to try and unionise. Um, recently, the, the vestry here um, passed a motion in support of the living wage campaign. And um, the living wage campaign, well, you could explain it a lot better than I could, really. Sure. So the living wage campaign is a, a campaign that's a, an international campaign, but has been picked up here by one of the unions that represents probably the poorest paid unionised workforce, which is the Service and Food Workers Union. And thank you, you know, we really appreciate the community support for the campaign, that's going to be important. What it's actually aiming to do is to push back against this, this growing narrative that work no longer has to provide a decent life, that it's okay to go to work, work all week, and still be at the food bank on a Saturday. And that, that isn't the deal about work. The, work. the deal about work is that you should go to work, work hard, exchange obligations, the employer with obligations to you, you with obligations to your employer, and at the end of that week, you should be able to live a decent life. You should be able to have good food for your family, decent place to live, pay the power bill, and be able to even do things like go on holidays and participate in the community. And that deal is just being under constantly. And there's not even a discussion about it, not even a discussion anymore about whether we want it undermined, whether we're prepared to accept that wages are just an economic transaction on the market, take what you can get. Um, or whether we're actually going to have this concept of work as a social good which has to de deliver a social benefit. Helen, as you heard in my introduction, I mean, we look back to, to Jesus as our inspirer um, and, and also other um, great people throughout history. I mean, one of my favourites is Dorothy Day who set up the Catholic worker movement. You have to go home and Google her and read up her fascinating history, but through the really starting at the time of World War I through to the 1930s when the movement took off and, and uh, Google tells me there's still about 200 plus Catholic worker houses today. Um, I mean, there's people 
obviously in, in your movement that you look back to have been inspirational people. Who, who in the trade union movement, um, you know, who do you look to as your exemplars? Sure. Well, obviously there are people of the past that really are strong influences still. I mean, people like Joe Hill, uh, you know, an agricultural worker who actually probably gave his life for the union movement, decided it was better to be executed as he was uh, in terms of a martyr for the movement than to fight trumped up charges. Uh, but a, a range of people, you know, being a trade unionist is the most, one of the most dangerous occupations in the world. And there are trade unionists killed around the world every year. 21 killed in Colombia over the last year, 10 in Guatemala. Um, you know, so actually we still know unionists. I left a conference in June at the ILO and on the way home the president of the Panamanian unions was imprisoned from that same conference. So we see this all the time, people still having to really um, make amazing sacrifices. Um, the Colombian teachers who are regularly uh, murdered if they get involved in the trade unions. One of them said to me at the ILO, you know, Helen, we don't mind being murdered, but we don't want to be murdered in front of our class. And, you know, it's that sort of inspiration where you see people just sort of stepping out there. Well, they're fighting for education. They're not even fighting for teachers' rights in Colombia. They're fighting for an education system. So those are the sorts of people. I mean, recently, these meat workers, these AFCO meat workers that were locked out and on strike here in New Zealand, if you had mixed with that community, and I'm sure some of you did, um, they were the most inspirational group of people. They gave up everything rather than accept what was going on in those meat works. They, they, we had a trade me site where they sold stuff. They sold their stereos. They sold their cars. They sold their kids' christening dresses. We had, you know, people attempt suicide rather than return to work um, during that AFCO dispute when things got really tough. And it was just, the, they stuck together and they were just amazing. You know, 1,300 workers, 86 days. Mm -hmm. And we were giving them $40 a week and that was raising $50,000 amongst the union movement. So those are the sorts of people that, you know, cross my path. Mm -hmm. And we, I'm, I'm aware we've got limited time here and people want to keep talking to you later, but just briefly, where do you see, um, you know, the challenges ahead in the next 10 years? And, and I ask that question because, you know, how can we as a church support um, those moves for equity and justice for all people? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I see, unless there is, uh, a consensus built amongst community groups that work, um, you know, has a role in the economic well-being of people and needs to have decent wages and conditions and a real movement for. We see ourselves as a social movement. We don't see ourselves as offering services for people who join, but as a movement that's trying to change the basic moral compass of society, really, to shift around to a much more equal vision of the future. Um, we see what well, we would have heard yesterday, the uh, finance minister saying that, you know, the recession's here for the next generation, we better get used to it. Don't wring your hands if you're at the airport saying goodbye to your kids as they fly to Australia. You know, we want people to wring their hands and to say this, this should stop and that people should be able to work um, and, and, you know, earn a decent wage, come home safely. The, the dominant narrative being pushed back is that work is now, benefic is now benefit employers are benefactors, workers are beneficiaries, they should take what they should get, it's a charitable relationship. Uh, all deference should be given to employers for the charity they provide and workers should not stick up for themselves and demand a decent life. And we're actually fighting against that and saying it's absolutely legitimate to expect a wage at the end of the week and that common um, sort of re reciprocal relationship that should exist. Well, thank you, Helen. Thank you for coming and being with us. And um, please, uh, afterwards, we have a this ritual called morning tea. And uh, please come and engage Helen some more with what she's raising. Thank you. Thank you.